So welcome everybody. Anybody who's just joined us, we are recording this session. We would ask that you keep your camera down and that you put questions into the chat. I'm going to formally kick off and introduce Kate in just a second and thank you very much all for joining us today. So for the, the video editor, good afternoon. I'm Amanda Brock. I'm the CEO at Open UK and it's a delight to welcome Kate Stewart along today as our first speaker in a series of talks forming the Open UK Summer of Open Source Software Security. Now that's quite a mouthful, but it's a really important mouthful because we have seen so much happen over the last 18 months around open source software, around infrastructure, dependability, curation, security, that it, it felt like we really needed to do a specific program. And this program will run for the next four weeks with four amazing speakers. The first three are individual speakers, the fourth is a panel. We will then culminate in an event scheduled for the 20th of September in London, when we'll look at these important topics with a, a large group face to face. The intention is also to stream that event and more details will follow. Through the summer of open source software security, we'll also be issuing various blogs and podcasts. So without further ado, to introduce our first speaker, Kate Stewart. Kate and I have known each other quite a long time. We worked together at Canonical over a decade ago when Kate was the release manager for Ubuntu. We're actually about to have our own release at Open UK. We're gonna be releasing State of Open, the UK in 2022 phase one tomorrow. So I've been under a similar pressure to that that Kate was under when I worked with her years ago. Being a release manager is not an easy job. These days, Kate has gone to the dizzy heights of the Linux Foundation where she's a VP and she's a VP of Dependable Embedded Systems and uh, also responsible for SPDX. Now, one of the, the critical parts of security is supply chain management. And Kate's very kindly going to talk to us about that, SBOMs and standards in open source security today. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction, Amanda. Yeah, one of the areas that I focus on is how what we need to do to make uh, embedded systems be dependable, specifically embedded systems using open source. And dependable in this context means, you know, is it secure? Can we use it for something that may be safety critical? Is it maintainable? Is it reliable? All of these um, good practices um, are things that sometimes we have to you know, make an extra focus on to make sure that open source is fit for this. And so part of this is the transparency of what open source you're running. So that's what I'll be talking about today and that's where SBOMs fit in. They all fit into how we make this stuff transparent so that we can do the appropriate security practices. And so just moving forward. What is an SBOM or Software Bill of Materials? Actually, it's just the metadata and the information behind the scenes. It's the relationship between the components we use to build software and um, the relationship, what's included in what, you know, which pieces are you including, be it from source, be it from you know, libraries, modules, distributions. All of these are valid use cases of SBOM, and I'll go into that a little bit like, more later. But it can be proprietary open source. Products are made up of a variety of information these days. And right now, um, based on the survey we did at the end of last year at the Lynx Foundation, 45% of organizations are actually using open SBOMs today of some form. Um, now, the other aspect we found is that 78% are planning on using them in this year. So why that great big jump? Well, that great big jump is a result of a lot of the um, you know, regulations and um, evolution of the awareness of the problem. Um, so the challenge that's happened that's really shaked the awareness is the security front. It's affecting people's bottom, daughter, you know, bottom lines and the dollars. And that suddenly gets a lot of attention happening. And so, um, People can't, haven't been able to answer, you know, is my product affected by this vulnerability? Um, there's a lot of people that lost a lot of their time last Christmas with the Log4j or Log4Shell one. Um, there's a variety of other ones that seem to have happened around Christmas time as well as throughout the year. Um, and they're always coming down. So there's a new one, you know, just around the corner. And so being able to remediate fast and understand whether you're impacted or not is going to be the key. Um, we're also seeing, you know, just in the last year or so, um, this is from a survey that Sonotype did, and they saw like over 650% increase. So the awareness is certainly there that we have to get this supply chain under control 
and that supply chain is um, elements from the build tool chains all the way through to what you distribute. And at any of those points, it could potentially be a point of attack. And so you're starting to see that um, there's awareness that this is a large cost to users. And so what we need to do is figure out, okay, how can we remediate them effectively and you know what's the cost like? Um, but you're sort of seeing you know millions of dollars and hundreds of billions and things like that and fines starting to show up. So we're starting to see this whole dimension um, of an economic model come into play here that wasn't there before. So, and a large part of this is um, open source. You know, of the one in that survey, 98% of the organization we talked to were using open source already. And uh, this is sort of, you know, we're seeing the same thing pretty much from other surveys as well. You know, the code bases that Synopsys has looked at in 2021, 98% contain some open source and over 70% of the apps were actually open source. And then, you know, back in 2016, you know, just over five years ago, there's probably about 84 open source components for apps and it's just tremendously skyrocketed up in the last year through that. Go ahead. You know what, okay. Kate, it's so interesting seeing this. So our survey coming out tomorrow shows 97% in the UK. So almost spot oh, on. We're all, we're, we're all lining ourselves up. <laughs> So, yeah, so we are, this... but when we look at the percentage on S bombs, it's okay. Well, I'm looking forward to reading the survey and seeing what data you've got. No question. Okay. Um, so just for people, for the background for people, um, the software supply chain, what it is, is it is effectively a uh, connection of the various types of packages, open source and pr proprietary that go into making a product. So just that's your visualization. It's the software from suppliers, developer processes, distribution processes, anything that's necessary to create the software um, is part of what is considered the software supply chain at this point in time. And of that, from that survey, 95% um, were concerned about software security. There's, you know, I think there's a bit of a correlation with the open source components, which are things made that may not be under their direct control, as well as that, but it isn't to necessarily say that open source is the only problem. It's the issue or anything else. It's just, these are part of the problem space that we're dealing with, and it has expanded considerably. So I'm looking forward to seeing your surveys. And, you know, the challenge becomes is, well, actually finding that vulnerability in that component through a whole set of transitive dependencies. You need to be able to search a full dependency graph and you know, not all dependencies are the same. Um, you know, some dependencies for like test tools, build tools, and so forth um, will have different relationships, and they may not be critical. They may be showing up in your dependency trees, but you're never actually running them on a system. Um, the other challenge we have in the industry right now is there's no single way of identifying a package, uh, an equivalent of a UPC code per se. There is um, package URLs and a variety of other type of mechanisms that are starting to emerge but we don't have one set of coordinates. So being able to refer to things and actually know definitively you've got the same thing, this is still a challenge for us right now. So what the SBOMs try to do is summarize um, the metadata of, you know, what's included in which, and is it partial? Do you know all your dependencies? Is it, um, you know, there's other things that are potentially hanging off of you that you don't know. So what are your known unknowns? And then what are your relationships between the components you're including in some sort of offering or some sort of release? And the transparency is going to be the key to improving the supply chain for us all. Um, you know, it was a, you know, from that survey, it was perceived as a number two action, actually. And making sure the first one was making sure you got a better vulnerability reporting system, which again ties into the whole security aspect that we're all worrying about. So we started seeing a lot of worry, um, you know, um, concerns emerging. Um, actually, it sort of started in 2018. Um, there's some groups of people that were coming together to talk about what is a software build materials and what should we be trying to figure out standardize on as a minimum viable and those efforts started happening under ntia back then um, but you start seeing awareness building up through these different stakeholders and in europe um, the guidelines for securing internet of things have references to um, having the sbom type of information and we actually saw in the us um, the iot cybersecurity improvement act um, 
basically was also having allusions to it without using the terms directly at that point in time. Um, I was tracking this type of stuff because it's all embedded and IoT of things is part of my space. And so seeing this and seeing how it's tying into the um, various emerging standards uh, was you know, kind of key. Last year in the US anyhow, and it seems to have triggered a lot, um, the Biden administration issued an executive order last May, in May of 2021. And in there, they, I think, have about 14 mentions of the word term SBOM. <laughs> and they then came and said, formally, we are tasking NTIA to define what an actual SBOM is. Now, NTIA had been hosting a whole bunch of multi-stakeholder workshops up to that point and meetings to define some of these terms and frame them and, you know, work through playbooks and how could this all work. But once that clock started ticking, NTIA had a public review period and then came up with their formal definition which was, you know, took in the public review and sort of tried to balance out the concerns that they saw. And in there, as you can sort of see, um, providing the um, software bill materials was one of the key aspects. And it even sort of shows up as a deliverable. And um, one of the things it also says towards the end here is to the extent possible for open source software, they should be able to generate. Well, um, my view is we should go to the source and open source should be able to generate SBOMs uh, anytime they do a build or do a release. So that was part of the sort of the challenge to make sure we could actually make this happen in practice. And so there's a couple of projects at the Linux Foundation that have been sort of, you know, focusing on being able to generate these SBOMs out. And um, Zephyr, Yocto, and Kubernetes are three of them, which are fairly popular projects that I can talk about a little bit more later. But Getting that automatic generation is key for us to move the ecosystem because you saw how much of that open of the ecosystem and products are made up of open source. If you're having to lift the open source part as well as your value add and your compositions to work, it's a heavier lift. And but if we can start to make it so that the open source ecosystem can do it easily, you'll be able to pull and reference to the stuff that the upstreams are generating. So anytime you're using their binaries, for instance, you're just having access to the S bombs. I think that's where we want to be going as a community but it's gonna take all of us working around the world to pull this together. So from that survey, um, one of them, which happened at the end of 91, uh, 21, I should say, um, how many people were saying that they're gonna be focused on it emerging. And um, the executive order was triggering a lot of responses because what was motivating that was the US government wasn't gonna be buying anything after August this year without having an S-bomb attached, or at least that was gonna be a negotiation point. But the GSA, um, and the government was part of what was motivating people to actually take it seriously. So they had a pretty good timeline that came out um, and they pretty much have executed to it over the last year and a half, two years. Um, in July 21, that guidance on what an S-bomb really was came out from the NTIA, as well as some other of the guidance that the executive order was calling for. And this document, uh, I would encourage people to take a look at it and read it if you want to truly understand what the definition is that a lot of people are aiming for right now. Um, the key parts of it are data field. There's key, some key data fields. So it's very much a minimum. It's trying to get what the minimum is. Um, things like, you know, the name, component version, any unique, other unique identifiers that might be there, any type of dependency relationships, and authors of the data, and then a timestamp. Um, there's a lot of debate that wanted to include hashes here. Um, but again, this was part of the formal guidance that came out from NTI does not have hashes. However, um, we per most of the people working in the space personally believe that um, having a hash is a good check as well when it can be possibly generated. And then there was a variety of automation support and they looked at some various data formats, one of which is SPDX and um, there's two, a couple of others. And then what are the practices and processes were defined as well. What, can you actually specify how, how down in your dependency graph can you go? You know, how often you generate it? What's the known unknowns? This type of information is important to be able to capture going forward. So those minimum elements, um, the supplier name, the component name, you know, fairly straightforward. The version of the component, uh, this is where we start to get into, people refer to suppliers by many names, components by many names, versions have different semantic versions, some are doing semantic versioning, others are not. Um, this is the part of the challenge of identity that we all have to work with. Where is it coming from and how do we actually connect to it? There are sometimes other unique identifiers that have been created in the ecosystem. 
um, there's some degree in the open source communities to standardize on Perl's package URLs. Um, and then there's the type of dependency relationships, you know, what, what software depends on which pieces, what's included in it. Um, and so, but they just have the basic includes. And then whoever created the SESBOM data, the metadata, that has to be recorded as well as when it was done, because every build, you may have a different timestamp and you may have slightly different things included. So this is the minimum elements and the SPDX22 specification, which became an ISO standard uh, last year, actually supports all of those and more. And so um, in further in that document, there is more information along that X is included in Y, but there's other relationships that they do recognize as potentially important. And then the license information, which um, is obviously a very useful aspect in compliance is also recognized as something that's important, but it's not defined as essential in the minimum elements right now. However, if you're generating this work, you may as well just include the licensing if you can pull it from the machines automatically. Um, so what we're seeing is a fair amount of the um, the sectors that are have that dependability aspect, the healthcare sector, the energy sector, the automotive, anything that potentially is interacting with um, safety certifications and so forth, and have regulatory agencies around them, at least in the US, seem to be doing call up periods of um, guidance. Um, the healthcare sector has been doing uh, proof of concept for the last year, actually two years now. And the energy sector has been doing what's working on one. And I know the automotive sector is working on it as well. And I know there's work going on in the automotive sectors in Europe as well on some of these types of topics. So we're seeing, and then the avionics side of it is interested in this as well. So the, like I say, most of the areas where there is um, safety elements, where you have to have that transparency, and SBOM helps you there tremendously because you have to know this stuff anyhow to go after the safety cert. So some of these places have these practices already in place, and this just gives them a standardized way of sharing this type of information. That's really interesting, Kay, and it, it's a question of the regulated sector, so that the, the rules are applying in regulated sectors as opposed to regulating coding. Have you seen anything come out of the UK around this? Because I think we're quite far behind the others from what we see. I haven't seen it, but I would welcome anyone um, who is tracking this from their countries and in the UK in particular. If you spot anything, please bounce it to me so I can have a, a picture of it um, and keep it tracking with the other things. Um, one of the things that just came out um, actually on July 1st is uh, the uh, International Medical Device Regulators Forum has come out with a consultation period and they've got the principles and practice for SBOMs in medical device security. Now, I know we all, national health system included, are using medical devices in uh, you know these practices and we wanna make sure they stay, they don't get hacked and they, and they don't share our information when we don't want to. So we wanna make sure we have a, a clean understanding of all the software that's in these devices. And so, um, there's a consultation period that just opened up for this, that's expecting for this area of Europe. I would encourage you to take a look at it. If this is an area you're interested in, and if you've got concerns, you know, give it feedback. At least this is an international forum. Um, but if we can get things going from the UK and anything you sort of spot in that direction, Amanda, I very much welcome you sharing and pointing me at them. Because this is areas that I think are, you know, it's, we need to be global here. Um, because producing and consuming SMOs, because the open source is global and it's a large factor as we've identified. And, you know, the producing and consuming is happening with an upstream supplier of some sort, creating releases. And then within an organization, you tend to have a lot of these policy checks and then someone is consuming it, be another open source project that's taking things that you put out or a customer. But, um, you know, benefits being seen from the SBOMs are the developers do understand the dependencies when they actually have to focus on them record them coming in and um, there's better compliance reporting and reporting that happens by having them available too. So there's many benefits that come out of having SBOMs and security is just one of them and you know fast identification remediation. Um, one of the things I'd like to sort of quickly address is there is a challenge when we use the term SBOM out there. Specifically um, the term SBOM happens can be used at any point through the software lifecycle. Um, this, this image from the software life cycle in the middle was copied from NTI's uh, survey of existing SBOM formats. But as you can see, between the planning, procuring, develop, you're going to probably be bringing in either source SBOMs or 
you may be only given a binary and you may want to put up some sort of tool on it to look and see what the binary analysis shows of it. So you may do a binary analysis on your s -bomb and try to guess some of the information when the information isn't there. But this sort of stuff comes in in that first part of the cycle where you're, you're doing your planning, producing, and, and planning for doing development. And then, quite frankly, as you're building an, your product, you may be wanting to catch pieces of evidence along the way, as well as the components and relationships between the components. Like if something is statically linked versus dynamically linked, there are implications on that. Because if it's just dynamically linked, it could mean that the operating system could change out from under you when it's running, and that could have a different set of issues for vulnerabilities as well as for licensing. And then, quite frankly, when you deploy your product, you may want to record the configs you've deployed it with and what you're invoking it with, because some of the code that may be vulnerable may not be reachable. So pretty much throughout the cycle, oops, we have to be able to look at um, having this type of information available to us. And we have tools for part of it right now, but not for all of it. However, sharing that in a format that is standardized um, and you know, sharing it effectively, we've got to be international here. And so the SPDX team spent a lot of time in uh, late 2019, 2020, taking the spec through um, ISO's certification and Open Chain has done the same. In fact, they, they preceded us because they were one of the first ones that called for, you know, you have to express what your SBOM is as part of sharing the information. And so you'll see in the earlier drafts of Open Chain, there's always been the concept of a bill of materials. So I was talking a little bit earlier about open source and upstreams, and um, we have to make it easy for them. Uh, we can't say, oh, you've got to these maintainers are doing the software and so forth. You've got to do a whole bunch of other stuff. We've got to figure out how we can do this easily and how they can do it easily with, you know, just changing a few places. So ideal, the ideal right now is with the one line change on a config file, you should be able to generate your SBOM every time you make your binary. And we've got the proof of con proof of this happening in both the Zephyr and the Octo projects today. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk a little bit about what that sort of looks like. Um, for Zephyr, um, we started talking about this last year. This is work that was done by Steve Winslow. And um, he went and he's been a part of the SPX community and started working with the Zephyr community to make this happen. So you're actually able to generate source S bombs here for the sources coming in. And then once they're compiled and built, you have a build S bomb. And you have your dotos that make the, the libraries and the libraries that are then linked to your L file. And we recognized in Zephyr that we had to be able to trace it right back to the source files. Um, because of um, vulnerabilities like Amnesia 33, where FNet was impact was basically um, the problem, the component that had the problem, but it was only some fun functionality inside FNet. And while FNet was in Zephyr's LTS, it wasn't in um, the actual images that went out, it wasn't even in the sources. And so we had no way of signaling that. So if you just looked at the components, you would have thought, oh, Zephyr's vulnerable, blah, 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 painful. But actually, when the analysis took it down to the source file level, we realized, yeah, no, we. It, it, the, code, the code that has a vulnerability isn't even included. So being able to have that traceability is one of the reasons that you have these source S bombs sitting there and potentially feeding into your system so you can link it back to it and understand what makes it into your actual build. And as a result, one of the things that's there right now is um, at Micro has a project called Renode, which is an open source simulator. And they go, and go ahead and build SPDX, um, well, they go ahead and build images uh, with Zephyr for like about 350 boards um, automatically every day for five different applications. And for each of these applications, for each of them, anytime it says built or passed on this dashboard, um, if you download that image, in addition to running it, you also have you know, those three S-bombs I was just telling you about. And that's like literally a one line change. And that's the level we need to be going to for this stuff to be automated. Another case study is what's happening with Yocto. And so Yocto and Open Embedded are widely used in the embedded ecosystem. And they are able to um, build a lot of images that are used in those sectors we were referring to earlier, including space as well. <laughs> um, there's a lot of um, interesting places you find the Octo when you start digging. Um, and so in addition to containers and regular images and boards, there's Deb packages for Debian and RPM packages and so forth. So there's a wide range that Yocto can touch and generate for. And what's interesting about working with Yocto is it is a host system, you have your host system that then creates your tool chain. And that tool chain, everything is hashed, and there's a lot of debug information as you're generating. 
and then that toolchain you've built then goes ahead and compiles your um, application, which then gets linked into creating your image. And so there's a lot of elements that could come in, and all of these tend to be recognized from a safety perspective. Um, you need to usually have to know what your tool chains are and your tools for building your applications as part of the safety analysis. So all of this becomes pretty key when we want to have these systems being dependable. So in addition to the security side, knowing exactly which pieces may have impacted your supply chain, uh, your build tools are part of your supply chain. Um, you have a line of sight into this. And so one of the things they've done is they've generated, so they are generating SPDX documents from each stage of this and having a full um, set of this relationships. And as a result, you can sort of see the relationships between the SPDXs and the packages itself and the files and the recipes. So you have a, the transparency of really understanding what happened behind the scenes and how this all got put together. And this also is a one line change in a config file. So uh, you can, whether you turn it on or not is up to you. Um, there's work ongoing. Uh, Joshua Watt at it, um, in the Octo project from Garmin has been taking a lot of the lead here, as has been Saul. He's been doing the work for the Linux kernel. So we can do this with the Octo. We can generate an SBOM for built image of the Linux kernel right now, which is kind of powerful as well um, from a licensing perspective as well as from a vulnerability perspective. And the Octo, um, pretty much it's able to handle all of these types of information um, right now today with the Octo and pretty much anything they can build, they can generate these SPDX docs for. So as you can see, that's pretty powerful as a way of going forward. And one of the things that uh, SPDX has sort of been going beyond what was asked for in that minimum set for SBOMs is that relationships. And so you can sort of see it from the Octo, but um, you know, contains is sort of the include or the equivalent of include, and then describes. And we have a very wide set of rich relationships as a way of expressing what information you have and how it may impact the other things. And this is useful in any analysis, especially for securities, as well as for licensing. So these things have come into play and are there to be used to help people understand um, whether or not they're going to be vulnerable or what license, how licenses potentially combine or you know what factors you may need to not worry about like you know some things to test case okay fine you may not need to worry about that in your final image um it may, it may be an issue but you may not need to re you know resend out your image type of deal things like that so from security's perspective um in spdx at least uh we've got uh, linkage to the common platform enumerations which lets people look things up in the mbd if there is one for the product um it's been around for quite a while we introduced the package URLs as a way of identifying things uh, in 2020. And then we also included the software heritage IDs as a way of understanding what's there, what artifacts are there, because they are persistent and stable. So there's more things emerging in this space, and we'll continue to add new methods and coordinate systems to be able to link to. And one of the challenges right now we have is the fact that vulnerabilities happen at a different point in time. Um, than when you actually build things. You don't normally go about building software and shipping it up with a vulnerability. Yeah, sometimes there's your zero days, but for the most part, you're trying to remediate that um, as part of your releases. And so uh, one of the guidance pieces that came up out of this is um, we need to be having, um, you know, what sort of, how can we have pointers to documents to describe the vulnerabilities? And how can you say, even more importantly, that, that there's a vulnerability that this is not affected? You know, how is this not affected? You know, when we were working on Zephyr, the only way we could say that was literally to generate a blog post to say, hey, no, we're not affected. So being able to communicate this information is going to be key for the automation. And as you can sort of see, the problem isn't going to go away. So we really need to be able to figure out how to get it to scale efficiently and effectively. So part of this was for us was, you know, taking SPDX and making an ISO standard, working with the international community to make sure we were addressing any concerns it still is freely available. Um, we made that one of the conditions. And you can pretty much download it from the ITTF site. And that's linked on the top of the SPDX spec if you go there. But if you want to look at the um, spec itself, it's available on, you know, we're tracking the updates live. And that's visible there on this uh, spdx.github.io. And if you're willing to and interested in, you know, figuring out more and participating. Our website will give you pointers, and we are very active. Uh, we're in evolving the specification. It's not just a once and done 
there's more stuff that's coming in and we're trying to move it forward. So uh, we're working to a large extent with um, other groups in the industry to make sure that this is effective for their needs. And, and I would encourage anyone that has concern, like, you know, has some concerns or has, doesn't have use cases to please reach out um, to me as well as to others in the SPX community. Uh, we've been working with the um, CIS um, 3TS bomb group and Microsoft's efforts there. Um, and they're helping us to define what the 3.0 core is like so that we can use it. And most of the changes, um, we're making sure we can evolve it from two, what we're doing right now with the two version of SPDX to the three version and have a reasonable path for transition. And we basically made it possible for people to formally join as members last year too, so that we can make all this happen pull together. Um, we're also working with the Open Chain Tooling Working Group, and they've been busy working on putting together workflows of tools to handle some of these, you know, use cases, and obviously vulnerabilities is one of them. But how this all fits in and fits together is an uh, open discussion. So getting the tooling in place for the open source side of the ecosystem, as well as getting the information in place, um, is you know certainly the focus right now, and that's what we're going to need to go to scale. Um, there are the tool, we are trying to cat track our tooling on the um, SPDX website. We have commercial tools being lo logged there as well as online tools. So if you find a tool that you know is working with SPDX that is not listed there, um, please reach out, open an issue, um, or you know, reach out to me or some, you know, tell me. We're, we're trying to add them as we learn about them. But there's a lot of innovation happening right here, right now. And um, literally in the last two weeks, both of these tools um, became popular. Well, because yeah, Dagger Boards happened just before Open Source Summit, and last week, um, Salus, which was released by Microsoft as their SBOM tool. So this is what Microsoft is using to generate their SBOMs, and that is now publicly available on GitHub. I don't think I don't know if the press releases have come out yet, but you can see the code up on GitHub, like most developer stuff. And Dagger Board got announced at Open Source Summit. And what Dagger Board does is it consumes SBOMs, and it then takes it in and matches them up to the vulnerability database and gives you a dashboard for this type of information. So you can, so small organizations um, are, have the ability to uh, take and look at this type of thing without you know, a large investment. And you know, Daggerboard came out of that healthcare proof of concept I was mentioning earlier. They needed this. And so the New York Presbyterian uh, Hospital team, IT team, all through the COVID, where they were busy with a bunch of other things, obviously, but we're working on this uh, to do the the sharing of information about vulnerabilities. And so they've made this open source so that, you know, smaller hospitals that don't have IT teams can potentially look at using things like this to help monitor the vulnerabilities for their devices. And it's that type of uh, collaboration and sharing in the open source ecosystem that's going to help us get to scale. So what's next? Um, we're evolving to the 3.0 version, as I was mentioning a little bit earlier. Um, most of the capabilities um, are all gonna be retained the most part, we are making a couple of breaking changes in a few areas, and we'll be documenting that very clearly, um, specifically so that we can scale um, into data lakes, as well as potentially move towards hardware eventually, and other system type of concerns. Um, right now, this is sort of the current definition of the model. We've also got working groups. So this core model plus legal working group will pretty much give you what you've got today with SPDX. But we've got a group of working on defects and vulnerabilities and what we want to track, how we want to link things. They are actually impacting the two, three version of the spec that's coming out. There is a group that's focusing on what we need to do for the build and tracking what information we want to capture from the tr build trackage. Um, there's a group that has been working in Japan um, from with the automobile side that wants to track usage. When do things end of life? Uh, a lot of the specs and a lot of the guidance is going to be calling for understanding what the end of life scenario is. And that's also actually relevantly interesting to the AI side of it, which is where data sets will be expiring. So there's a group working on the AI and what we want to be tracking for AI in this release. So if anyone's interested in these areas, um, feel free to reach out. I'll happily put you in touch. And if you see of things that we are missing that you think we should be able to catch or um, as part of the build information and the usage information, um, certainly please reach out. So I guess with that, I will, um, cut, you know, take it down to, um, you know, if anyone wants to help, um, if your organization is using or planning to use SPDX, um, 
and you're already a member of the Linux Foundation, it's no cost to join. If you want to just um, join, um, click this link and then join the, join the SPDX, then we can use your logo on our website to, uh, so that people know that you're working with SPDX and you can talk with them on that topic. Um, if you know of a commercial tool or an open source project um, that's able to generate or consume them, um, please open an issue because we're going to try to better catch all the landscape so people can find things and then search for what type of SBOM they need for what type of purpose. Um, you know, uh, the SBOMs that Physology generates for the sources to do full analysis of the information there are going to be quite different than the types of SBOMs that are being generated out of your build tool and maybe different than the SBOMs generated um, when you deploy. So being able to, us to really understand the life cycle of all these pieces and how they fit together is a challenge. And so any crowdsourcing is definitely welcome and appreciated because um, there's only so many hours in the day. And then if you have a use case and you want to make sure we can get it supported, um, you know, please reach out. Uh, uh, SPX is grown by people giving us use cases and us trying to figure out how we can sort of generalize it for everyone or for the wider community. And so with that, um, I think that pretty much summarizes what I had to talk about today. Thanks, Kate. Okay. It really helps to sort of contextualize it and bring it together. Now, can you hear me clearly? Because I know my Wi-Fi is playing up slightly. You can. Great. That's good news. So we do have one or two questions for you, but um, I, I think it's just interesting what you're saying about participation. Open UK hasn't joined SPDX, and maybe we should. And that would also allow someone to participate to represent us. So if anybody uh, who either listens to this call now or watches the video really wants to get involved in their organization, isn't going to, let us know, admin at openuk.uk, um, because I think we should look at how we engage with SPDX going forwards and perhaps consider joining. And I hope some of the people who are watching and listening to this will also consider joining. It's amazing work that's been done over a very long period of time to pull all this together. Um, if to SPDX, how do you dip a toe in the water? Because th this is a lot and for many people it will seem overwhelming. Yeah, uh, so dipping the toe in the water is probably... Um, so I'm going to say that again you... in case you didn't get it. So it yeah. is a lot to take on. I did. Yeah, um, the on-ramp is something we're trying to figure out how to improve for people because <laughs> there is a lot of use cases and there's a lot of you know knowledge that's come into creating all of this. Um, the advice, best advice we've got so far right now is to find a tool that you're working with. Well, basically look at your application, figure out the tools you're working with today and see if it can generate SP, um, an SPDX doc, uh, be it a commercial tool, be it an open source tool. Um, if it's an open source tool, um, you know, reach out to that community if you can't figure out how to make it happen so they can improve their documentation. Um, if it's a commercial tool, then you have, you know, if you've already got a commercial relationship, you should be able to get the support, quite frankly, and then quite generate them. Start generating them, start looking at them, see if they make sense to you. If they don't make sense, start asking questions. Um, we have a place, like a couple times a year, we'll get together with various people making tools and we'll do sort of a, a what we call a um, doc fest, where people will bring in docs, uh, SPX documents, and other people have tools that consumer and analyze them. And we try to understand, you know, are people using doing doing the apples to apples on the same packages or on the same applications? And it's amazing how different tools interpret things slightly differently. Um, and so getting it to us to the stage where we can actually um, Make sure that all the tools are sort of making doing things that generally make sense to everyone um, is the, one of the current challenges for scaling for us right now. So if you know getting started, find a tool, run it, see what you get. Does it make sense to you for the purpose? And then uh, reach out to the community um, if it doesn't make sense, either the community of the tool or if what the value is being stored doesn't make sense and the spec seems wrong to you, reach out to the SPDX community. Um, it's open to anyone to join into the tech calls. You don't need to be a member to do that. Um, and But it's open to anyone to open issues or pull requests to fix things. And we very much welcome our participation of the wider community. 
And we've had some questions around the interpretation of SBOMs. So not just how do you interpret them, but where does the ownership in that lie? Who should be accountable for that? And I guess that's part of a bigger picture. But it'd be interesting to yeah. just, first of all, think about SBOMs and who should be responsible. Is it a trusted third party? Is it a developer group? Who would that be? So one of the guidance points for that minimum SBOM is you should be able to articulate what you're shipping and then the, at least the direct dependencies behind you. Ideally, you should have your full dependency tree. But you should at least be able to have those. So what ones you've directly linked in. And um, so that gives us an ever cursive structure um, which lines up nicely with the supply chain, such that if you have what you know, if you know what you know, and you can go to the next person, they can basically give you what they know, and we can recur And when there's an issue, we can have a chance of trying to discover it through the systems. Um, getting that structure set up—that's a minimum. That's not the ideal. Um, the indirect dependencies, you know, as much as possible should be articulated. I know, like when we were doing the Ubuntu's release. You have the seeds and you have to basically work your way through all the seeds to actually build up the packages to ship and re release. And that is that whole chain of dependencies. So things you need to do to build your packages as part of a distro are pretty much what we need to be doing here as well. Um, so where the most knowledge is um, and most trust is the person who's actually shipping something should at least be the level plus one. But the type of SBOM um, that you want probably for uh, the security perspective is to really understand what went built was built into it so that build s bomb is probably having that one accessible it's going to be the most value from the security perspective i'd say also the deploy s bomb um, in terms of what configs how you deployed that image is also going to be key to understanding do i have a problem or not when a vulnerability happens the source What's really sorry carry on uh -huh. no the, the source s bombs and the binary third-party binary analysis uh, source S bombs are definitive, and linking them to the build S bombs is going to give you your best path of truth all the way back, especially if you've got hashes in there. You know it'll be reproducible. You know you exactly 20 years from now you can still say these were all the pieces that made it in, and be you know and know that you've got the same things. Um, the, the binary analysis and the third party, um, some cases we just can't get access to um, the sources, and so there at least it's giving you some clues as to what is there and um, what you might want to consider. So I think it's taking the best information you can at any point in time where the most knowledge is and getting it from that point is where we need to be sort of trying to do it. Like the upstream, the open source projects, if they can you know, issue out S-bombs when they put a release out for the sources, then you have a good definitive set of sources to link to when you do your builds. Um, but you know, that's a wide, it's a really wide ecosystem where we're having to shift here. Yeah, it is. And as you talk about that wide ecosystem, I think there's an interesting point, which are a couple, actually. The first is that this has not come at us out of the blue. The Biden administration's ordinance of last May, something that Open UK actually responded to because we saw it as being incredibly relevant to the UK. Um, that That's not something that's caused all of this. For people like you and I who've been around open source governance for a long time, this work has been going on in open source for over a decade. And it's the culmination of a decade's work that allows us to have this amazing output, but also the transparency that's inherent to open source. And I suspect a lot of people don't understand, first of all, that security is a, a software issue. It's not an open source issue, but actually that the open source response is so worked on and joined up that we potentially have something that is going to be provide great utility to those who are using open source, perhaps even over proprietary over time, particularly when we have a security issue to deal with. And the piece you're talking about there about the, you know, the single point of truth, perhaps we could call it. I think we're going to end up with various bodies around the globe, probably um, bodies that have some level of either regulation or government interaction where we're going to have those single points of truth enforced on us over time. And that's, again, not an open source issue. That's something about making sure that we understand how software works in our public infrastructure, our national critical infrastructure, which with your, your work on software being dependable, Kate, is something that I know has been top of the agenda for you, right? Very much so. And it's, uh, yeah, the 
problem started initial like recognition of the problem started actually in 2018 29 sorry 2008 2009 actually mm -hmm. when working with various colleagues um, when in one of my earlier job roles um, when I was still at Freescale we had no way of sharing the information and we were having to spend the same time doing the work on the same packages and it just was sort of like this is stupid <laughs> how can we start to share this stuff and yeah so it's just no sharing and more use cases over time and it's something that you and I actually have worked on when I was in Canonical where I would be as the the lawyer or the one of the lawyers having to pull together contracts and of course customers wanted to see and they called it all sorts of different things but effectively it was an s-bomb that they wanted attached to the contract and we were having to generate those in lots of different ways to satisfy customer needs that this standardization dramatically helps so it will have a great utility within commerce as well I think and um, we have a couple more questions here and Lorna is saying how helpful this is, which is great. The link between the number of companies requesting S-bombs and the companies using them. So the stats that you gave at the beginning of the presentation, Kate. Um, mm -hmm. From that perspective, was there any groundwork that had to be done in the US to ensure that all the companies requesting S-bombs know how to use them once they have them? Oh, um, the, the Do that one first, there's a bit more. Yep, yeah, okay, let me do the, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a lot of groundwork. So the groundwork really started on consumption of S-bombs um, with the, the earlier NTIA efforts in 2018-2019. And uh, there's work, and if you go to the ntia.gov slash S-bomb site, uh, you will find playbooks. What does a consumer need to do with them? What does a producer need to do to create them? Um, and trying to operationalize it. So we're just on the starting of that operationalization app. Ah, can't say the word today. We're just on the start of that journey of operationalizing everything. And um, getting it to the stage where uh, people, you know, have tooling in place, have experimented with it, have taken it to the stage um, is, you know, it's going to be a journey even longer. Um, we'll get there, but it's the executive order just provided them, them initiative. Like I say, it, it provided a very clear um, roadmap for helping to define the project, but the work started to define what a nest bomb was, and it has built on that definition of a minimum viable. So that was uh, to your point earlier, Amanda. It was more approachable to start with something and then build up from there. And so, um, what we've been doing on the SPDX side is when we came up with the two two release, we made sure we could handle that minimum. We had a lot more, as you can sort of see but um, we can handle that minimum that there was being asked for. So that gives us a, a basis for interoperability and have a baseline expectations. And the guidance I was showing you for the international guidance, is, looks like it was based off of some of those the pieces in there. Uh, the FDA has put out preliminary guidance. Um, it's calling for those fields. It's also calling for end of life and one or two others. And so, you know, figuring out what each of the regulatory agencies is gonna be looking for um, is going to be uh, one of the challenges I think for all of us going forward. Yeah, and uh, Lauren is also asking, if there's still work to be done on that front, she's keen to hear what awareness is most needed from the users, especially in companies where cybersecurity teams are small. And frankly, we would hope that all companies are getting to the stage of having those, but the reality is that really small companies who are gonna be part of this ecosystem may not even have those. So this has to be made as simple as possible. Yeah, and that's where that Daggerboard project um, I was talking about um, was there and that's why a lot of the focus anything we're doing for open source pretty much is going to be effective and useful for these small, very small companies with limited budgets um, but dagger board is there so you know seeing if someone can bring it up run it and then as you get s bombs in consume them would be one way of seeing hey, yeah is there any of the com you know components vulnerable because the vulnerabilities change in a different cycle over time and so like you could be you know setting up something that's periodically checking you know, dagger board or some other project. Is there any of the components I have in my products vulnerable and then be able to pass that forward? There's a variety of open source tools that are available too, um, and they can all use help making them better and hardening them up. But there's um, some pretty good starting points out there. Um, in Europe, I would, um, and, and other places too, the open source software review toolkit or it is out there um, for if you're building products, take a look at that. Um, Microsoft just open sourced their um, tool for generating them. 
So there's, it's depending on the ecosystems, depending on how you build your projects in your companies, um, there are options out there. And if they're missing, adding features and helping the other ones evolve is very much welcome. Um, and so, you know, making it better for everyone as we go along. And if you were to give us advice, because uh, I've said to you already, our survey will show slightly different results in terms of awareness and adoption of SBOMs and SPDX when we share that tomorrow. Um, if we were to have a couple of pieces or one key piece of advice in terms of this process in what you've seen in the last year, what would they be? And do you think that having that ordinance, having that piece of legislation or governance is the key? Does it need to come from government? I think um, companies, the lesson I think I've learned over the last 10 years is there are companies that will do what's right just because it's what's right. And then other companies will do it right, what's right because they have to um, for economic reasons. And um, right now we've got the alignment of what's right for economic reasons with the do what's right for um, really understanding what's going on. And so, I think we've got, we'll finally get over the hump on uh, SBOM adoption, I think, in the next couple of years. I think it'll be a lot of step-by-step -step improvements, but, you know, I, the getting it to the stage where everyone has an awareness and then figuring out what pieces they're missing um, and then asking for it will help us all generate documentation and help us with on-ramps too. Mm -hmm. Well, Kate, thank you very much. It's been really informative. I, I've heard a lot about SBOMs over the years, but I, I find bringing this all together in the one session super helpful. Very much appreciated that you've kicked off our, our Summer of Open Source Software Security. I will definitely share our survey and report outputs with you tomorrow. And uh, thank you again. I hope that the other sessions go as well as this one has. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Ciao. Thanks everyone for attending.